Hey everybody, this is Dr. Maples. We're going to continue our lectures on urban sociology and today we're going to get into something called urban ecology. Now I want to go back in time just for a moment. Remember in my last lecture I talked about how um, urban sociology as a field popped up in two different time periods in the United States. It was back in Chicago in the 1920s uh, through approximately the 50s and then in urban sociology uh, we found it popped up again in uh, the 1980s at uh, New York University and at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. With these second round of urban sociologists were particularly interested in how economic resources available um, to people, depending on where they lived in the city, shaped their experiences. One of the big things that they supported and studied was the idea of urban ecology. And that's simply the study of uh, community structures and organizations that are present in the cities. The idea here is that not all cities um, offer the same experiences, and even within one city, not everyone has the same experiences. Uh, we find that cities often include a lot of unequal sorting, unequal resources, and um, unequal social and human capital, something we'll talk about more in the future. The idea is that depending on where you live, the city can be a very different experience. Think about the city of Lexington. Depending on what part of Lexington one might live in, it would be a very different experience experience. Now this field of urban ecology is very excited in thinking about the sociological imagination too because we can think about how where you live might give you access to different resources and how those different resources might shape your experiences as an individual. Now one of the things that urban ecologists like to do is break down resources into smaller chunks because we want to make sense of them. And they start by splitting up something they call space from something that they call place. Space is the easier of the two to explain, so that's where I'm going to start with. Now with space, we're thought of literally any space in a city where you might live or be um, that provides uh, an area where an event can occur. This can be everything from the buildings there, the parks that are there, the roads, open lots. We don't notice these spaces. The whole idea, in fact, with sp space is that it's pretty mundane, it's pretty boring, it's pretty just there. And that's the whole thing about space. It includes all the stuff that we might see in these areas. Place is a different idea. Place is bigger than that. It attaches the emotional meanings and experiences of living in a particular place. Um, and that's where the urban ecologists thought about these urban arrangements and uh, how the unequal resources were sorted out across a city might really shape your experiences. Now, place is something that can truly shape your experiences. Space is something that we often experience um, as part of our everyday life in a city. We're going to focus on space for the rest of this lecture before we transition into place because place is a little trickier for us to explore. Now with space, we can truly think about it being frankly pretty boring. Space includes um, three categories. Uh, one of those categories gets broken into subcategories that urban ecologists talk about. Um, and let's look at some of these and see really how boring they are. Space can include the networks of how energy, people, and information move across the city. So that includes everything from uh, sidewalks to um, the water utilities, electric utilities, um, the people that share information, internet access, and so forth. Networks move information and people and so forth. Uh, mass transport, also interestingly enough, included as a network because it moves people from place to place. Buildings as a form of space are also pretty boring. They are just literally places where activities happen. They include homes, political offices, commerce, uh, industry, churches, uh, government buildings, coffee shops, you name it. They are the open shells where things are uh, created to happen. Then we have open spaces. We have the hard open spaces, which include things like courtyards, malls, and plazas. This is a public activity space. And then we have the soft areas, which give you kind of an escape from the urban area, uh, such as a park, a garden, or nature uh, reserve. Central Park in New York exam uh, would be a good example of uh, soft spaces. Um, whereas hard spaces could be um, those of you who live in Richmond in um, the uh, Richmond uh, Mall area near the uh, 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 theater. There's a, a huge plaza that they use for concerts and things like that. That could be a good example of uh, what we might call a, a courtyard. Um, nonetheless, these are all just containers. They all contain areas where things can happen. 
Um, they include the ability for activities to happen. So things may need power. If they have power, then they can occur. If there's a, a, a spot where a person can sit down and put up a hammock, then that gives them a space that they can interact with. Um, but they're really just containers for where activities can happen. Um, now, having or not having these can shape your experiences. Let's think about the absence of having a library in your town. Um, that could be a very small impact or it could be a very big thing because libraries are a source of public information. They're a source of public internet for people who may not have internet access at home or not have access to a computer. Um, they're also an access point for information. The boards at the very front of libraries have all sorts of public events that are happening, ranging from food support to presentations happening and more. So not having a library building could be a big problem. Likewise, too, if you live in an area that has um, limited affordable housing, that could definitely be a really big issue. Um, not having church spaces, that could actually shape how people might want to live in certain areas versus others. Not having sidewalks can be a strange impact on things, too, because if you don't have sidewalks, this shapes actually how you might walk about your city or if you might have to use something like mass transportation to get from one place to another. And what if you don't have mass transportation access? That's a really big thing for a lot of urban areas. We often have this mistaken belief that mass transit takes us everywhere equally through a city, and that's not at all the case. In fact, we see if certain parts of urban areas, people may have to take a taxi to get to the bus stand, or they may have to take a bus to get to a transit station to get to a subway and go from there. It's not just, you know, you can get on mass transport and go anywhere in the city. No, that's not at all the case. In fact, uh, I can think of places like New York City where even when you get off the subway, you may be walking for five or six or even ten blocks to get to where you want to go just because, you know, they drop the, the station off, drops you off at one central hub. Then you're expected to perhaps get on a bus or a taxi or walk it to get where you want to go. Open space is boring though, but it still shapes our experiences and how things might be encountered. Place, place gets a little fancier. Place can be extraordinarily powerful in shaping our experiences uh, in interesting ways. Place is something that binds us to cities. Many people speak of um, you know, an emotional attachment to a city because of some particular activity that they are involved with or some particular idea. The Chicago hot dog is a big thing. People from Chicago want hot dogs a particular way, perhaps. People who love Lexington, they may support horse racing, and that might be part of their emotional attachment. Well, that's the sense of place. That's where we have these extraordinarily powerful ties that bind us to these areas. Even when we may leave them, we still have an emotional connection. I, even though I don't live in the city of Knoxville any longer, have a very strong emotional connection to that city. Um, place can also include the opportunities to make areas unique. Um, they're kind of almost the opposite of space. They're when we take space and make it something unique and special. Um, you know, New York City has lots of sidewalks, but when we think about Broadway, it's really just another road. And yet at the same time, it's been made into this extraordinary hard space where people, um, instead of driving through the roads necessarily, they can walk. There's a big area of it that's just all foot traffic. It also has um, you know, this extraordinary world famous theater district for plays and things like that. Um, it's, it's extraordinary. It's, there's just no other word. It's something special. And that's place. That's what makes it so important. Likewise, you can think about how these unique resources shape our experiences. Imagine being in a scenario that you had access to the Smithsonian's anytime that you wanted them. Imagine living in uh, parts of Virginia or even in District of Columbia where you could take a bus to the Smithsonian's and you could experience the Smithsonian's. What might be the educational value of being in a, a school that's in that area? Think about if you're uh, in a school in some of the counties here around Eastern Kentucky University, you know, they don't have anything that's even remotely comparable. Museums that might exist in small towns are one room local museums that while very valuable, they don't pale in comparison to, to something like the Smithsonian. You can't even put them on the same table for conversation. So you can imagine how place can be a very special thing in supporting us as can space. But that said, place is also something that can shape your life in very unpredictable ways. And I want to stop this lecture here and in our next lecture explore how place 
as we think about um, increased poverty in urban spaces since the 1950s, can do just that because of the uniqueness of the place and how it's formed, how that can shape our experiences. As part of that lecture too, I also want to spend some time demystifying what we think about poor urban areas. And I kind of want to give you a more concrete reason of why they exist to begin with, and hopefully that will help to set aside some of the beliefs that you may inadvertently have about urban areas that aren't quite correct. So, that said, we're going to stop here. Space, boring, simple, containers for activity, place, these extraordinary, important, unique things about cities that tie us to these areas, but also shape our experiences in very interesting ways, as we'll come to find out in our next lecture. If you have questions about these ideas, you know where to find me. Otherwise, I will see you in our next lecture. Take care.